This is the day the Lord has made. I'm so happy to hear you say that. That always makes my day, you know. It's a good way to start things off. Welcome to Lake and Bethel. It's good to see all of you. It's good to see that you choose to spend your Sunday mornings here. And to our video audience, welcome. It's good to have you with us too. And um, we appreciate you. So, Marie, do you want to kick this off and then I'll do my spiel? All right. Good morning. Uh, since we are coming close to the end of the school year, I thought it would be nice to give a little update on Hand to Hand. I have some pictures and of, of a few of the meals that we've given to the students this year. This year, we have had 268 students that we've been providing meals for. Last year, we served approximately 200 kids. So that's about a 25% increase this year over last year. I try to keep the cost at about $3 a student. And um, the total cost for the meals this year is probably about $25,000 that it'll cost us. And this was made possible by you guys, by your donations. So I would like to thank you for your donations. And I would also like to thank those who helped pack the, the meals and for those who delivered the meals and anything else that you've done to help with this. You know the old saying, takes a village to raise a kid? Well, it takes this whole congregation to feed these kids. And I thank you for your generosity. In Matthew, Jesus said, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. We are being the hands and feet of Jesus, and thank you for that. I also want you to, on the calendar, we saw that it showed packing for this coming Tuesday. It's actually not till the 16th in the afternoon at 2.30, and on the 30th in the evening at 7 o'clock. So if you're available, we could really, we really appreciate and could use your help. And then on another note, Friday, May the 10th at 6 o'clock, we're having a mother-daughter banquet here. We will be selling tickets after this service. Please check your bulletin for all the information and be sure to bring your mom, your daughter, your friend, sister, whoever, and come and have fun. What's that? Yeah. Well, I don't think so much the cat or dog. Um. And asked her to order spaghetti sauce one time. Yes, uh, I found that's kind of cool because that yeah. does you know then everybody can contribute that way too. So I found online through Amazon that there was a company that we could get a can of spaghetti sauce for seventy-seven cents a can, which is so much cheaper than any place here. But there was a limit of ten cans per person. So I got a hold of a whole bunch of people and said, "Can you order me ten cans?" And so we were able to fill all the bags with the cans that people had ordered for us. From Amazon. From Amazon. <laughs> so anyway. I never thought of Amazon for food, but hey. Yeah, thanks for what you do. You're welcome. All right, so a couple other announcements. The food truck is tomorrow night. Show up about 5 o'clock and see if they've got some work for you. Um, we need lots of volunteers for that. And same for Supper House, which is Wednesday. Wednesday at 3 at Temple Methodist. Just show up. These are ministries where we're feeding people and actually doing some good in the community. So by all means, if you can show up, do so. And then uh, youth group is meeting on the 14th and the 28th. So if you're a high school person or if you're related to one, uh, note those dates. Paula says she needs more golf players. Uh, we have a golf league. She says you don't have to be good. You just have to show up and play golf. So if you would like to be a part of that, see Paula. They don't all know who you are here, Paula. Would you stand up a minute? There's Paula. So see her about golf. And um, they have riotous fun with that game. So uh, do that. And then I'm going to make an announcement that kind of ticks me off. But I keep getting asked about the rapture happening tomorrow. And most people that ask about it don't like my answer. But folks, here it is. After 
you know, those daily Bible readings that are in their bulletins. I've been on that schedule since 1975. When we finish the book of Revelation, that will be my 70th time through the New Testament since I was in my 20s. Okay? And I can read it in Greek. I have two advanced degrees, and I'm ordained by the oldest denomination in the United States. And I'm here to tell you today, after blowing my own horn about all this stuff, there's not going to be a rapture. Okay? It's fiction. It's there because of bad Bible study. And it's my job as a pastor to put you at ease about that. If somebody is insistent that there's going to be a rapture, tell them to sign the title of their car over to you before tomorrow. Okay? But here's the thing. If the rapture does happen, I'll apologize. Okay? But it's not going to. You know, these end of the world types, they've made a lot of money, they've made vast fortunes off of this, and they push people around, make them scared, and it just ticks me off. So, you know, if you want to really counteract, there because they'll throw Bible verses at you and everything, just tell them to read 2 Corinthians 5, where Paul talks about how we get a new body and all this sort of thing, and there's not going to be some kind of a rapture and all that, but I do believe that it'd be kind of fun if we all just laid some clothes in our driveways and hid out for the day and, uh, you know, but it's sad that I even have to talk about that, but I, I don't want you all to get caught up in that sort of thing. It's not cool. All right, let's join together in a prayer. Let's pray, shall we? Lord, you've called us to be your emissaries, your representatives on this planet. And so many of your people are uh, creating fear instead. You've come to help us get rid of fear so we can live our lives fearlessly, without anxiety, with peace. And we keep letting it go the other direction. So we're sorry for that and want to uh, do the best we can to spread your peace around in so many ways. We want to do that as far as our planet, our world is concerned. And so today we lift up before you all those leaders uh, who are making decisions about wars and things like that and ask that your spirit will permeate their lives, that they'll be doing your will and not the will of aggressive armies or corporations or whatnot. Let them see what you want them to see so that peace can be brought to this planet. Then we think of our own community and all the things that are going on here. We're thankful to be here. We're thankful to live in this part of the country. Thankful for all the blessings that you send us. And you have blessed us. So... Today, as a group, we say thank you to you for that. We really are grateful, and we can even be more grateful as we think about it. Of course, there's needs, and you've asked us to bring all the needs before you, and if everybody in this room was going to list all of their needs, we'd be here a couple of days. But each one of us can think of two or three people who need a special blessing, so in this next moment of silence, we want to lift them up to you. And then my prayer is that everyone in this room hears your voice. That everyone leaves here today knowing that they have indeed communed with you. So come close to us. We're opening the door. We're reporting for duty. And we invite you to be an ever-increasing part of our lives. Amen. You know, Mr. Weesey's, i got to talk to you a minute. You know I don't go unscripted very often, but I really appreciate having you up here. You know, with the hat and the blue jeans, when I was 
your age, they would have thrown you out of church. You're welcome here, bud. Thank you. Oh, and, and the beard. Yeah. yeah, the lion must have his mane. All right. So we're talking about religion upgraded today. And uh, that's just one of my favorite topics. You know, I used to use Windows computers. I did for years. The last time I was about four years ago, I had to do an update on it. They said, you have to do it, and I put that off, put that off. The update took four and a half hours. And two computers, you know, and I was, did a dumb thing and I updated them both at the same time. So there I sat waiting for those things to get, to get done. Well, then I, I switched to Mac. I just got tired of it. I decided, nope, I'm going to do it. I bought a Mac laptop and a Mac desktop. And they have updates too, but it doesn't take as long. And I always like it when they update because everything works faster and it's upgraded. Upgrades are a good thing. Then, just within the last couple of months, my surround sound system stopped working as the way at least stopped the way I wanted it to and it's 15 years old I couldn't believe it I looked it up the receipt I keep them because I'm a nerd and, and I, I looked it up it's 15 years old so I, ch I started checking out new ones and I bought one it's unbelievable the difference I'm fussy about sound and I have to watch you know the Rolling Stones videos and I couldn't believe the difference so much better Upgrading is a good thing. Then, those of you with agrarian backgrounds, I don't know if you remember the old 720 diesel John Deere. Now, that was a good, solid workhorse. But John Deere had this thing like Harley Davidson does where you have to have two cylinders, no more. And so this thing was a full diesel with cylinders at least as big as a three pound coffee can and it was uh, it vibrated and shook a lot it's a long stroke diesel for those of you who are motorheads will understand that it was really hard to get this thing started so what John Deere did is they put a small gas engine on it too and what you would do is you'd start the gas engine they call it a starter engine you'd start that engine up and then you'd that engine would start the other one up the the big old two-cylinder diesel and it that thing would all those John Deere's ran so rough they had to have flywheels on the side to to keep the engine smooth but that didn't really work if you didn't have a load and you were going down a path or a two-track with that thing it, you just feel it shaking like that all the time because that engine had so, so much uh, vibration to it but it was like I said a good workhorse the other thing about that tractor that was unique is that it had a hand clutch and John Deere hung on to that hand clutch for years all through the 50s because one of their executives had polio and he couldn't use his legs so that's why John Deere decided to stay with the hand clutch the whole time it was kind of a miserable tractor to use but I, uh, I spent a lot of hours on one of those and then they upgraded in the 60s this thing came out the 4020 diesel it had a foot clutch really getting modern i don't think john deere's i think john deere still have a hand clutch except their sales went down you couldn't compete with the rest of them but that one had a foot clutch and a six cylinder diesel engine both foot and hand throttle it was easy to manipulate had plenty of power the upgrade was a good thing. And then those of us who have some gray hair can remember this. The 64 Impala wagon, the ultimate family car. Those things were wonderful. You, could, you had the back seat that faced back and you know the kids could make obscene gestures at truck drivers. It was, it was a wonderful vehicle. And um, yeah, it probably got seven miles to the gallon, but hey, it could haul anything you wanted to. It was basically a truck with a, a car skin on it. Then Chevy upgraded. This is a 24. Now, it's, is it Traverse or Traverse? I don't, I get you. Is it Traverse? You don't care if I say Traverse, do you? 
Oh, get over it. Um, but it's, uh, it's an upgrade, and these things are actually kind of, I'm not a Chevy person, but um, this thing looks like a pretty good family vehicle. It's good to upgrade. That's what we need to do with things, you know. And, I mean, what do you upgrade regularly? Your kitchen appliances, they, they just don't seem to last as long as they once did. Uh, what about an upgrade to your religion? You know, many of us were raised in American evangelicalism. Most of us were. We were taught that, you know, as far as our soul is concerned, the devil has one vote, God has, or Jesus has the other vote, and we cast the deciding vote. And that's not bad. But then we add all these blue laws to the re our religion. You know, I went to a Pentecostal college, and they had different rules for the women than for the men, of course. But the women were expected to wear long dresses. They were not allowed to, you know, dress themselves up. And they never cut their hair. And mind you, this was the 70s, and they had hair down to their hips. And they also were not, it was considered uh, dishonoring to God if you wore perfume or deodorant. Now, this is Oklahoma. It's hot there. And, but it was not a sin to eat a lot. And so these girls were plump, curvy, and they didn't smell very good. And so you could always tell when they were, one of them was in the room an hour after she left yet, because to wear deodorant was to disrespect God. And then Tulsa County, where that's located, has over a hundred Baptist churches. If you can imagine that, one county, over a hundred Baptist churches. And the Baptists, or as they say, Baptists, don't drink, supposedly. And so that was the rule that they attached to it. And that's why all the liquor stores in Tulsa have back doors on them. But they were there. They were, uh, that was a rule that they added on. Now, the reform people aren't any better. I mean, we had rules tacked on, too, when I was a kid. Sundays, we had all of these different rules that we had to follow. Couldn't do anything on Sunday, hardly at all. And I remember after I moved to the 550 miles south of Sioux Center into Tulsa, my parents came and visited me. And they went to a restaurant on a Sunday. And I know my mom thought she was going to go immediately to hell for it. She was so troubled by that decision that my dad made to go to a restaurant. I said, well, we could eat, you know, in the college cafeteria, but my dad didn't want to do that. We do add stuff to it, things you have to do or not do. Most of these have been dumped because we've upgraded our religion. But a lot of these things can be dumped if you have a careful and informed Bible study. We know that Jesus gave us a huge upgrade. The Jewish faith of the, of the day that he was born into, like many of the pagan religions in the surrounding areas, demanded sacrifice. They demanded that you had to kill animals to please God. And he made it, Jesus made it all obsolete. He offered himself as a ransom so that no more sacrifices to angry gods had to happen. Now, they never had to happen in the first place. People just dreamt that up. But, you know, they happened. I believe they were influenced by demons. The devil wants blood. Jesus wants life. Jesus came to set us free from the fear of the angry gods. He came to set us free from superstition. He radically changed religion. He upgraded it, most certainly. And the passage that I like to use at least twice a year is from Hebrews chapter 8, talks about that. So we're going to take a look at that. I need to re read this passage myself twice a year, uh, just because I think it's very important. Now, the background of it is this letter to the Hebrews, so it's written to Jewish Christians who were still struggling to put the Jewish faith away. And they talk about a high priest. And the Jews, you know, they had one official place of worship, 
that was the temple in Jerusalem and the high priest was the, the big dog there. He was the one who controlled things. So here we go, Hebrews chapter eight. But now Jesus, our high priest, has been given a ministry that is far superior to the old priesthood. For he is the one who mediates for us a far better covenant with God based on better promises. See, the old priesthood demanded sacrifices, demanded that you bring animals or grain or money or wine. Jesus, when he overturned the tables of the temple, he was setting kind of a preview of what he was going to do. But that's what they had to do. You know, and if you were a boy on your 13th birthday, you had, they still, Jews still practice this today, the bar mitzvah. But it was cool if you could go to the temple and sacrifice a goat. And what you would have to do then is bring the goat to one of the temple priests, hold the goat while the priest slit its throat. And then you had to put your, head, your hands on the goat's head as it was dying. Now, imagine being 13 years old and watching that. That would leave a lifetime imprint. This is what's going to happen to you if you don't toe the line, buddy. And that's how they used fear to manipulate people. The old covenant. You had to have bloodshed to cover your violations of it. And the core of this covenant is, of course, the Ten Commandments. Lots of other rules were added on, like how to wear your hair to how far you could walk on the Sabbath. They actually had a rule about how far you could walk on the Sabbath. The new covenant is far better. This passage goes on with this. If the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no need for a second covenant to replace it. See, the first covenant didn't work. No one could keep it. So Jesus brought us a new covenant, an upgrade. The passage goes on. But when God found fault with the people, he said, The day is coming, says the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. They did not remain faithful to my covenant, so I turned my back on them, says the Lord. That's fairly frightening when God says he's going to turn his back on you. But he came back. He wants a relationship with his creatures. So he made this new covenant. And here comes the new covenant. But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel on that day, says the Lord. I'll put my laws in their minds and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. See, Jesus came, he gave us only one law. That's the law of love. Matthew 7, 12, treat others the way you want to be treated. John 13, love each other as I have loved you. It doesn't matter how long your beard is. It doesn't matter how far, how you cut your hair or how far you walk on the Sabbath. Those things don't matter. What matters is what Jesus has done for us. And the passage goes on with that Jeremiah quote. This is from Jeremiah 31. Those of you who took the class, of course, that were exposed to that earlier. And they will not need to teach their neighbors, nor will they need to teach their relatives, saying, you should know the Lord. For everyone from the least to the greatest will know me already, and I will forgive their wickedness, and I will, I will never again remember their sins. Literally, he's gonna write his covenant on our hearts changing us from the inside because changing from the outside didn't work the new covenant works which is why I believe in it then verse 13 one of the most important statements of the whole New Testament right here when God speaks of a new covenant it means he has made the first one obsolete it's now out of date and will soon disappear. Just like the 720 John Deere is obsolete. It was good for its time, but it's obsolete. The old covenant is obsolete, but it hasn't disappeared yet. 
People keep digging up Old Testament rules and attaching them. People keep inventing new rules. People just keep bringing it back. Don't bring it back. You absolutely must not allow any thoughts, any thoughts at all that righteousness can be earned, as it can't. Last Sunday we celebrated Easter, the beginning of the new covenant. And now it's all grace. You're saved not because you're such a goody two-shoes. You're saved because of what Jesus did. You don't have to say any Hail Marys or Our Fathers to prove that you are repentant. You don't have to give up certain foods during certain seasons to prove that you're righteous. You don't even have to wear special underwear to go to the temple. None of those things matter. You are saved. You are in because of what Jesus did. He paid the price for your salvation. You cannot add to it and you can't take away from it. You can only receive. <coughs> you can only receive it. Jesus got rid of all the religious red tape. You know, other religions still glory in their rules. Take Islam, for example. They can't eat pork or shellfish. So no more bacon-wrapped shrimp if you're going to convert to Islam. They have to pray five times a day. You know, once, at least once in a lifetime, they have to make a trip to Mecca. They have to fast for a month during the feast of Ramadan. They're not allowed to gamble. They're not allowed to use drugs. They're not allowed to use alcohol. Well, the Reformed Church would be empty if that was the case. But here's a stickler. They're not even allowed to have photographs in their houses. You can't take a picture of your mom and hang it on the wall because that's idolatry. That is not the way of Jesus. He did the sacrificing for us. The old covenant is obsolete. The idea of trying to please God by following rules is obsolete. That doesn't mean all rules are bad. You know, we need traffic laws, for instance. We need speed limits, things like that. You know, if we didn't have that, everybody would drive like Michigan residents. Uh, see, the point is that driving the speed limit won't get you any points with God. Jesus did that for you. You can't add to it can't take away from it and that's just a simple fact now the best way that I know to illustrate that is with this chair the thing is that you know for a long time now at least 10 years I've taught that salvation is very similar to getting into a chair you know it's as you trust this chair to hold you up so you trust Jesus to save you and it is that simple I want you all to know that. You know, it's the rest of this stuff is just religious stuff that people throw in. But it does not do you any good. It does not get you closer to God. It does not help you score points with God. You just simply have to trust him to save you. And that's all that Jesus said too, is trust me. And that's what we end up doing. We are going to reenact now the... Lord's Supper, where this new covenant was started. So let's, let's begin with that today. What we're going to do is remind ourselves of what, how this new covenant got going. You know, in the Reformed Church, there's a very simple explanation of it. It says it's a threefold feast. It's a feast of remembrance where we remember what Jesus did for us, how he started this new covenant. And it's a feast of communion. Communion by meaning we commune with Jesus in a special way as we commune with each other. And it's a feast of hope. Because in, in this new covenant, we're promised the eternal life. We can, it's a, kind of like a foreshadowing of the eternal feast that we'll be having, where we can... You know, meet all of our relatives who've gone before us and those who are coming up after us. 
So that's what we need to remember about communion. Also, we remember that in the night before he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, he broke it, and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. From now on, every time you eat this, do so in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup. And after he blessed it, he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. He used the words new covenant, which meant he made the old covenant obsolete, as the scripture tells us. Let's pray together. Lord, we can't understand all the dynamics of what we're about to do. This sacrament that's very old, and I'm sure we misinterpreted parts of it as time goes on. But we're using it today as a remembrance, and we're asking you to speak to us through it. So we open ourselves up to you and want to go forward. Amen. All right. Um, Reformed Church has always had open communion, or we've always had the option of open communion. Not all of our churches have done it. Lake and Bethel does. If you're here, you're invited to participate in the sacrament with us, whether you don't have a church membership or whether your membership is in Timbuktu. We don't care. You're here. We want you to participate. You're welcome to do so, and we hope you do so. What will happen is the servers will serve you first the bread. And by the way, this is, I'm told, where's Donna? It is gluten-free with extra sugar. Is that right? Yeah, you continually complain how it tastes terrible, so I put a little oh. extra sugar in it. I think you should make me a loaf of this. I will. <laughs> and I will sit as you eat the whole thing. Uh, there might not be gluten in it, but you can go into a diabetic coma, right? <laughs> but anyway... Uh, what we're going to ask that you do is you hold on to it until everyone's served, and then uh, we'll partake together, and we'll do the same with the cup. And the cup is grape juice. There's no alcohol in it. So, servers, you'll come forward. This is the body. This is the blood. Broken and poor. communion we share in his love this is the body this is the blood I will remember everything Lord you've done for me Take a brand new sacrifice that set me free. I hunger and thirst for your love. Come feel me today. This is the body. This is the blood.
se pleure. The bread which we break is the communion of the body of Christ. of blessing which we bless is the cup of the new covenant. Would you pray with me please? Lord we've taken in some bread and some grape juice as a symbolic reminder of what you did for us. Now we ask that you become an ever-increasing part of our lives. Just as we've taken you in symbolically, we want to take you in spiritually. We want to connect with you more and more each day. 
bless us with that. Amen. Let's receive the Lord's benediction. And now, in whatever you do or say, let it be as a representative of the Lord Jesus, all the while giving thanks to God through him. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you today and always. Amen. As always, thanks again for joining us. We have two services on Sunday morning. And if you're in town, we'd invite you to come once at 9 o'clock and once at 11 o'clock. And if you wish to support Lake and Bethel, you can go to lakesandbethel.org and follow the steps there on our website. Or you can just look at this QR code, scan it in with your phone, and you can give through Secure Give. And all your gifts will go directly into our account. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.